So, Dark Souls 1 was such a hit that obviously the next step would be to make a sequel. This was the mindset of Namco Bandai, and why the hell wouldn't they want to continue their franchise? It was insanely successful, and you'd be a stupid business not to capitalize on that success. However, Miyazaki and his A-team had other plans. They went off to work with Sony to make a new exclusive for the PS4. This left Namco Bandai with a decision to make. Wait for Miyazaki, or publish a new game. And I think that wad of cash over at Namco Bandai's bank vault will tell you what they chose. Dark Souls 2 was headed up by Tomohiro Shibuya and Yui Tanamura. Miyazaki was a supervisor, but I think we can all assume this was largely the work of a different team. This is a very important distinction to make, and we'll get into why as the review progresses. Since Scholar of the First Sin was released for PC in a working state, meaning I haven't modded it, I'll be able to use my footage for most of the review. However, I do want to compare the original release of Dark Souls 2 and the Scholar of the First Sin re-release at some point, so I'll once again be taking footage from Nero Mysterio to show everyone what Dark Souls 2 looked like when it first released. Without further ado, it's time to review Dark Souls 2. By now, you'd likely know that plot isn't really much of a soul's focus. We're plopped into the land of Drang Lake, said to be in the same world as Lordran, but not necessarily connected to Lordran. For all intents and purposes, it's a brand new world. Your player character has entered Drang Lake to rid the undead curse from his body. It's pretty bog-standard stuff, but you could say the same about every other Souls game. The important thing is that Dark Souls 2 stays on the down low and doesn't force feed you a narrative, and that'll always be welcome. While I don't think narrative should be a focus, characters and lore should definitely be well developed. Demon Souls didn't fare amazingly with their characters, but they were at least memorable in some way, like the Blacksmith Twins and the Wax Maiden. Dark Souls was really where they hit the nail on the head, at least for me. Lotrek was an interesting case study into the mind of a sociopath, Solaire is the fan favorite, no more really needs to be said there, Oscar was a standout tragic hero, and the crestfallen warrior was a cynical ass. I remember them all for one reason or another. I could only really tell you one of the NPCs I remember from Dark Souls 2, and that would be the Emerald Herald, since I had to constantly talk to her to level up. I guess there was also the blacksmith, but I don't even remember his name. The other characters aren't bad per se, but they are so forgettable. It's a detriment to the construction of Drang Lake if I barely remember the people in it. Part of what made Lordran feel alive, so to speak, was the aspect of characters actually doing something. Lotrek headed out for the Firekeeper, and if you don't intervene, he will kill her. The Maiden and her escorts were seen in Firelink Shrine, only for you to meet them again in the Catacombs, where in which you need to slaughter her now hollowed escorts. They had agendas, and you got to follow along with their story, be that happy or sad. They were dynamic. Change over time was one of Lordran's greatest strengths, something that Dark Souls 2 has a lot of trouble following. Every character in this game is the definition of static, with two exceptions. The cool dwarf guy with a blue sword and the Emerald Herald. Now, the dwarf guy was cool just because he popped up occasionally and I like his caricature. The Emerald Herald is more dynamic because near the end of the game, she keeps popping up in new areas and commenting on them. She sort of feels like a reskinned wax maiden with even less of a soul, if that makes any sense. There's nothing interesting at all about the Emerald Herald. In fact, the only reason I kept talking to her was because I needed to level up or whatever. This means that we end up with a minimalistic story and a ton of characters thrown in whom have no reason to be there. In my opinion, this doesn't mesh very well. It leaves Drang Lake feeling incredibly artificial. It opts for the same type of open world structure that Dark Souls established, only to throw away the interconnectedness that make Dark Souls' world building unique to begin with. If anything, it's just a disguised level select. The center hub is Majula, where you do your blacksmithing and item purchasing and other miscellaneous stuff. Every place you need to go branches out from Majula, and none of the paths ever intertwine. You'll probably be following the pathways in a preset order, for certain items to open specific roadblocks. 
In other words, the system is a strange bastard child of demon souls and dark souls. While it isn't bad, and the level structures don't suffer, it harms the world of Drang Lake by making it painfully obvious that what you're doing was designed. In a Souls game, that is a horrible thing to make your players feel, especially when immersion and world building were some of the best assets of the first two games. I mean, you have choice in the beginning. You can enter the Lost Bastille through two entrances, but only one of those entrances took me on the right path anyway, so the other path was completely pointless. To be fair, the optional pathway into the Lost Bastille could be considered extra content, something I greatly welcome. It'd be nice to go off the beaten path and fight a few bosses I may not need to conquer just for the hell of it. At least, it'd be nice if there weren't stone statues blocking everything and confusing the hell out of everyone. The use of stone statues to block progression is one of the most immersion-breaking things ever. Instead of placing doors with keys, FromSoft needed to find some convoluted way to make it feel more true to the world, but in doing so, they made it even more obvious that Drang Lake is generated by a computer. You need a fragrant branch of yore to break a person out of their statue form, but you don't find them strategically placed like keys. For the most part, fragrant branches of yore are just found lying about Drang Lake any which way. If the fragrant branches of yore were just another form of key, I'd be somewhat okay with it since I'd be guaranteed access if I just explored a bit further. But since branches of yore are perceived to be finite, who even knows if you want to waste a branch of yore on this statue or if you should save it for another? What if you need one later and don't have one? It's a stupid method of progression gating, made even more silly by the fact that doors with keys still fucking exist in this world. Drang Lake is fucked up geographically as well. In Majula, you can actually see into the distance where it foreshadows a place you have yet to go. The only problem is when those places don't line up at all with where you're actually ending up. For instance, you can see Hades Tower of Flame in the distance. You see it over there, yeah? Now, let me take you on the path to Hades Tower of Flame. So, I have a question. Geographically, should we be here? If your answer is yes, you're probably Zoro from One Piece. Congratulations. If that's anything to go by, it feels like the designers just slapdash Drang Lake together in an attempt to live up to Miyazaki's legacy in some way. The focus was clearly not on the world, lore, or anything of the sort, but at least it looks pretty. 1080p 60fps with Scholar of the First Sin makes Dark Souls 2 look gorgeous and play as smooth as humanly possible. Even though they don't make a whole lot of sense geographically, I really love staring at the scenery. The Dragonary is breathtaking. Seeing all the dragons flying around and the peaks of rock formations with a castle looming in the distance, it's like a visual orgasm. Drang Lake Castle had a similar effect on me. Walking up those stairs, all I could do was stare at the castle in awe, with the rain glistening off my surroundings. If there's one thing Dark Souls 2 does right, it's the art direction. Even if a majority of these locations aren't very memorable, they're damn beautiful, and I can definitely appreciate that. It does lose a bit of that bleak atmosphere present in Dark Souls, but it's not enough to ruin the atmosphere altogether. Things look a lot brighter, but places like the Undead Wharf still manage to creep me out. I can concede that this game isn't about immersion or world building, as sad as that makes me feel. I'm willing to let that go if the game is still rewarding, but the question is, is it rewarding? This game doesn't change a whole lot from what Dark Souls established. You have to kill four bosses to gain access to another batch of bosses to gain access to another batch of bosses to kill the end boss. All while getting armor, weapons, and leveling your build. The same humanity system is back, but instead of using humanity, Dark Souls 2 has elected to use human effigies to make you human again instead. The drawback to not being human is that every time you die, your maximum health drops a bit. Eventually, you'll be down to about half of your normal max health. It's a cool punishment for death, but human effigies are so easy to come by, I almost see it as a pointless addition. Although it is there for people who want a challenge, and it's certainly a small step up from Dark Souls. Where it succeeds far more, 
more is in playstyle choice. You can go for a caster, another pyromancer type, a sword and shield tank, or even a dual wielding swashbuckler. It's similar to the options we've had in previous games, but it feels like all of them are fleshed out now. I was able to switch between what I wanted to do quite easily thanks to the inclusion of items that reset your stats, which is an addition I hope they keep forever. Being able to respec makes me feel less afraid of committing to a playstyle because if I don't like it, I can always change to something else. This level of freedom is extremely welcome and needs to stay. I'll always say this, but the more choice the player has, the better. However, what isn't as free as it initially seems is the navigation of levels. I mentioned this before, but Dark Souls 2 is essentially a linear destination, quite possibly the most linear a Souls game has ever been. There are a ton of bonfires, and you can warp between every single one at the start of the game. I thought the amount of bonfires in Dark Souls was perfect. They were spaced out enough to make you feel tense if you travel too far and didn't want to die and risk losing all of your souls. It was a mental mind game of should I keep going or should I fall back? What if the next bonfire is right around the corner? Or maybe it's an enemy that'll kick the shit out of me. I loved arguing with myself until I eventually kept trudging on. The seed of doubt fed into the immersion of the world to make it feel more threatening. It was a great balance to the health system as well, since five Estus would usually be able to last you to another bonfire if you played well. Dark Souls 2 doesn't really have that same tension. I mean, yeah, it still pays to play it safe, but the risk associated with dying just isn't there. As much as I bitch about having to run through bosses again, I don't mind the parts between bonfires because the sections feel like their own challenge. When they're shortened, I feel less incentive to be careful. If I have less incentive to be careful, I rarely feel tense. If I don't feel tense, it's hard to get attached to Drang Lake as a world or feel any significant reward for conquering a challenge. The feeling just isn't there, and it sucks. It's especially true when you factor in the difficulty design. Recall back to the Dark Souls review, I spent a hefty amount of time explaining why that game is fair, something I also believe of Demon's Souls for the record. It's important to note that Miyazaki prides the worlds he creates over difficulty. Difficulty was never the point, it was just another component that made the worlds he created feel more authentic. It was a pillar, among other pillars, supporting the core that is the immersive experience of a Souls game. In my opinion, though, Dark Souls 2 throws that core to the wayside and makes difficulty the core of the experience, both a crucial misunderstanding of Miyazaki's design philosophy and a failed execution of a brand new focus. Even though I am fundamentally against switching the focus of this series, it would have been fine if they pulled it off correctly. Unfortunately, this game is built off of frustration, not difficulty. The trend you'll notice in Drang Lake right off the bat is that it absolutely loves to throw everything at you all the time. There are so many things designed to hinder your ability, it's fucking insane. How about we throw two giant mammoth things at you? They almost one-shot you, and you need to fight them both at the exact same time. I'm sure you can handle it, you're fucking hardcore, right? Prepare to die, am I right? How about when you're in the Lost Bastille? Look at how many fucking enemies are beyond this door. They're all the exact same, exact same attack patterns, and they just fucking ambush you and they are right before a boss who is equally as bullshit. The Ruined Sentinels. Fuck these guys. You spawn right next to one, so you need to react quickly. There are two other carbon copy sentinels across from you, but they won't aggro until you kill the first one. If you can manage to kill the first one without falling off, the other two will start lumbering over to you. It's near impossible to avoid a hit when they're both up on the same platform with you, so you have to get out of there. When you drop down, they go full on, with one attacking while the other is waiting around. They give you almost zero time to counterattack, and it's so bullshit. In the same area, they redo the bell gargoyle fight from Dark Souls, but instead of fighting two, you fight four of them. Yeah, that's right, four. And their movesets were amped up to feel even more aggressive and fly around and shit. Needless to say, it's incredibly frustrating. Of course, the issue here is the game throwing multiple enemies your way all at once, and Dark Souls 2 seems to have some sort of fetish for this concept. Hades Tower of Flame is nice at the beginning, when there are only a few giant enemies to fight. They're fairly challenging, but manageable. Then, for no fucking reason, three of them stand in the same circular room. Once you beat the middle one, you have to fight the other two at the same time, because they both aggro immediately after the first one's death. If that wasn't enough of a kick in the face, there are smaller enemies who are fucking hard on their own, but just become bullshit hard when paired up with several large enemies. The little guy should be your focus, because he's more powerful, but when you're focusing on him, the big guy swinging his fucking hammer at you. 
and if you focus on the big guy, the small guy will eviscerate you. You sometimes need to go to a laborious extent to use your bow and arrow for aggro, and this is ramped up to 11 when you enter the Shrine of Amana. You need to deal with foot soldiers to aggro from incredibly far away and often rush you in pairs. So what you quickly learn is to use your bow and arrow for aggro so you can fight them one at a time. Then they introduce casters in tandem with the melee characters, so I ended up looking like a fucking fool while I pull out my bow trying to get a shot in at the casters so I could kill them and then going back into hiding. The fun part about casters is that they never run over to you, because they can sit back and fire away. This meant that I had to waste almost all of my arrows by the end of the damn place, because rushing in and trying to take out the casters is suicide, because the casters shots home in on you. My god, the Shrine of Amana is the most tedious place in the entire game because of that. Oh, but that's not even the only instance I can bring up. The Iron Keep has one of the most infuriating rooms in the entire game. First of all, I kept getting invaded at this bridge, and I'm not exactly sure why since I used a human effigy to ward off invasions. It's really annoying when you're trying to focus on fighting some armored knights and then some jackass invades you, player or non, and fucks you up for no reason. If that wasn't enough to piss you off, you keep getting rushed by these armored knights. I'll admit, seeing them rush up to me was really intimidating the first time I saw it, because I sure as hell didn't expect the enemies to react like that. It was a nice change of pace, until I actually got inside the keep. When you don't know what you're doing in there, you'll quickly get rushed by two knights with an archer knight nearby trying to snipe you. Even managing to take them out, going into the next room, there are two knights that aggro, which is manageable but extremely annoying. Those aren't the main issues with the Iron Keep, although they do contribute a lot. The next room is what convinced me that Dark Souls 2's difficulty design is horrendous. Let's go through this together. So there's a knight archer who immediately starts shooting at you. You'll probably go for cover behind a pillar, and then a melee knight proceeds to rush you. You fight off that knight, but there's another one shortly behind. If you aren't fast enough, you'll need to deal with the two of them at once. Meanwhile, that archer keeps repositioning himself to get more shots on you. If you go a teensy bit further up, there's even a third guy and another archer to shoot at you. Once you manage to survive that, after several tries, you'll need to go across the bridge. If you don't know where you're going at first, you'll probably just try to cross the bridge like normal, where there are two archers at either side of the ridge. Even if you manage to take one out with your bow after a thousand hits or so, you'll probably drop down thinking you can take the one at the end. So you rush over there and start wailing on him, and then a bunch of guys drop down from fucking nowhere and obliterate you. Surprise, surprise, there are fucking three of them on the roof next to the archer that I didn't notice. If you want them dead, you need to use your bow and arrow. Shocker. All this to find a boss that isn't even required. Why would you put an optional boss fog door somewhere this close along the main path behind a ridge with like six fucking enemies and then have the audacity to make the boss one of the stupidest things in the game? The smelter demon is yet another humanoid sword-wielding enemy, something Dark Souls 2 loves to utilize. Fun thing with him is that he's constantly radiating heat, so while fighting him, your HP dwindles down like you're poisoned or something. So... How is that fair, exactly? I thought the point of difficulty was that you could get around taking damage if you were absolutely skilled enough. I feel like forcing people to take damage goes against the very nature of a challenge. I never bothered to beat the Smelter Demon, because I knew by the time I finished him, I wouldn't feel reward, I'd feel relief because the bullshit is over with. This is a very important point of contention for one simple reason. In Dark Souls, I went out of my way to fight every single boss, even the optional ones, because I was having so much fun fighting them. I wanted to see what each boss was like, and wanted the reward of conquering all of them. I have no such desire in Dark Souls 2, something that extends to the DLC. I played one of the DLC worlds, saw that it exhibited every single worrying aspect of enemy placement as I mentioned above, and basically gave up so I could just finish the damn game. I won't make judgments about the DLC, but if it's anything like what I saw in the first few minutes, I never want to touch it. Level design isn't the only worrying aspect of this game. Starting you off with one Estus Flask is a slap in the face. You get these weird healing crystals that restore health over time, and they take so long that it makes battle feel less fluid than it used to. Even when you use an Estus, it restores health even slower, as if to make the game even harder for some ungodly reason. It's a good thing you can get more Estus, because the healing crystals need to be purchased from a vendor or pilfered from some very select enemies. I just have to ask one question. What was so wrong about the original Estus system that it needed to be changed? Well, I'll tell you why. It's designed in the game's favor, not 
yours. And that is such a stupid design philosophy. Yeah, I know this seems harsh, and a lot of you are going to chalk it up to my gaming ability. After all, shouldn't a hard game be designed in the favor of the game? I don't blame you for thinking that way. The other games seem brutal sometimes. But the very important distinction is that those games weren't designed with difficulty in mind. It was manageable to get out of tough situations, and you felt rewarded when you wormed your way out of a seemingly impossible scenario. This game leaves you feeling frustrated. I can't even count the amount of times I died and ended up blaming it on the game. Some of those deaths might have just been me, but since the game had been so bullshit up to that point, it became hard for me to tell the difference. It was designed so well in Dark Souls, it was so clearly designed well that it hurts. If you can even believe it, it was worse in Dark Souls 2's original release. Scholar of the First Sin patched out a few of the enemies, but the original release of Dark Souls 2, oh no. People had to deal with the bullshit in full. The original version of Dranglight Castle is a perfect example of what the designers wanted from this game. There are like 15 enemies in each room that gang rip you the first chance they get. I guess it was to the point where people complained about it so much that in Scholar of the First Sin, almost all of the statues look like they should be alive, but they never come back to life, which is a lot more jarring. But believe me, even though it's really jarring that these statues don't come to life, it's a lot better than having all of them come to life at once. How could this even happen? Remember back when I said a new team was behind this? I have a theory, one that splits Dark Souls' philosophy in two. There's the Miyazaki school of thought, with a focus on creating an authentic world and immersing you in that world, and the Bandai school of thought, where difficulty is the focus and capturing that niche audience willing to take a beating is a priority. The new team completely transformed what this series stood for. This change of priority and the utter failure of that transition is one of the reasons I will probably never replay Dark Souls 2. I didn't necessarily hate my time with Dark Souls 2, but while playing, I always had this nagging feeling that kept noticing the awful difficulty design, and about halfway through the game, I knew I was only going through it because I loved the series so much I had to finish every game. It wasn't because Dark Souls 2 gripped me. It was that I had to see what the game was like for myself. This glaring flaw is so heartbreaking because there are things I enjoy about this game. The Undead Chariot was a really unique boss battle, and unlike the Bed of Chaos or Dragon God, the gimmick worked well. Weaving in and out of corridors, taking out enemies before they became an issue, then fighting the formidable Chariot Horse. But then there's the issue of actually getting back to the boss, in which you need to slog through a shit ton of enemies and cross the bridge to get back to the fog door. Eventually it got so tiring I gave up trying to fight them and kept running across the bridge over and over again and succeeding only half of the time. Boss was fun, getting there was not. The Iron Keep is so damn breathtaking. A castle built in a land full of lava, but then you realize it's geographically out of whack and is quite possibly the most infuriating level in the game due to faulty design. Using your torch in the gutter was interesting and kept things tense since you didn't know what floor you'd fall through or where you'd end up. Kind of a shame this is really the only place where I ever used my torch. But immediately after the gutter, you're dropped into the Black Gulch, where fucking everything can poison you. Blow darts everywhere, worms blocking your path, an invasion from some character every goddamn time. And of course, it's before a boss fight. A boring as fuck boss fight, may I add. See, I wanted to play a tanky character, because I like to be able to tank hits but trying that against the Rotten is just not feasible. At least for me, because I didn't know that adaptability would be so damn important to my every move. It controls the speed at which you drink Estus, the invincibility frames counted when dodging an attack, your poise when blocking an attack, and a shit ton of other stuff. It controls a hell of a lot, and because my poise wasn't high enough, I couldn't block effectively. And since I had such a high equip load, I couldn't roll because I'd just do a flop on the ground. What I ended up having to do once I got the hang of things was attack him once, and then back away and wait until he attacks, then go in for another hit. I did this a staggering amount of times, dying a bunch, having to slog back through the Black Gulch until I finally beat him after about an hour and a half of solid attempts. It was so fucking boring. It was about as boring as the Royal Rat Authority, basically a discount Sif. 
His attacks are so easy to dodge, and the only real threat to your life are the four poison rats that spawn to poison you. Yet another design philosophy designed to generate bullshit instead of fair difficulty. There's nothing memorable about this boss, other than the bullshit it tries to pull. In the end, I'm left thinking about all the bullshit rather than about how pretty the game is, or how smooth it plays at 60 FPS, or cool bosses like the Undead Chariot. What I'm left thinking about is how the majority of bosses are unfair and uninteresting, how many goddamn humanoid enemies are thrown at me in a single room, and how I wish I could just be playing Dark Souls, or Demon Souls, or Bloodborne, or anything else. I don't like Dark Souls 2. I initially thought I didn't like the game because it was one of the last Souls games I played. Maybe there's some Souls series fatigue at play here. But that thought got shot down when I realized I was playing Demon Souls alongside it and enjoying the fuck out of myself. Clearly there's something wrong with the design of Dark Souls 2, and I will always believe it's because the designers made difficulty the focus, when that was never the point of Demon's Souls. As a result, Drang Lake isn't a place I want to go to. I'd rather spend time in Balataria or Lordran, where I know I have an immersive journey ahead of me, full of unique boss fights and a fair challenge that leaves me feeling rewarded. They're the definition of escapism. Dark Souls 2 is the definition of a goddamn stressor. It doesn't let you escape, it just reminds you of the tedium and frustration and monotony of everyday life. It's boring, uninteresting, unfair, and overall leaves a bad taste in my mouth. For now, I'll just say this. The game is okay. It has pros and cons, and it saddens me that instead of the pros outweighing the cons, the cons in Dark Souls 2 most definitely outweigh the pros. I'm sorry for those of you that enjoy this game, you can keep on enjoying it. I think it's a mess of a Souls game, and I don't get pleasure from playing it. Luckily, the series didn't end there. Remember, Miyazaki was still working on another installment in the form of Bloodborne, a game that I enjoy much, much more. For now, though, have a great rest of the day, and certainly, have some well-deserved fun today.